ever, ever are you to give out his address or phone number. I understand, I told her, though I wasn't sure I did, as I didn't know who Jerry was. This was 1996, and the first Jerry that came to mind was Seinfeld, who presumably wasn't a client of the agency, though one never knew, I supposed. Okay, she said, sitting back in her chair. You understand. Now, go. I'm going to take a look at your correspondence. She gestured to the pile of letters I'd typed neatly stacked on her desk. As I left her office smoothing my skirt, I happened to glance at the bookcases directly to the right of her doorway on the wall opposite the side of my desk. I'd been staring at that bookcase all day, staring at it without seeing it, so focused was I on my typing. The case held books in corresponding hues, mustard, maroon, turquoise, imprinted with bold black type. I'd seen these books countless times, in my parents' bookcase and the English department closet at my high school, at every bookstore and library I'd ever visited, and of course, in the hands of friends. I'd never read them myself, due at first purely to happenstance, then to conscious choice. Books so ubiquitous on the contemporary bookshelf, I barely noticed them. The Catcher in the Rye, Franny and Zoe, Nine Stories, Salinger. The agency represented J.D. Salinger, I'd reached my desk before it hit me. Oh, I thought, that Jerry. Okay. So, yeah, I took this job at an agency, not only not knowing what an agency was, but not knowing that they represented J.D. Salinger. Um, and, um, and all these years later, really, just pretty recently, it occurred to me that might have been one of the reasons that my boss hired me, because I wasn't a person who she suspected was wanted the job because of access to Salinger, which was a whole cast of, of young people. Okay, so now we're gonna skip to you a few weeks later. How many times had I been told that Salinger would not call, would never call, that I would have no contact with him, more than I could count? And yet, one morning, a Friday, at the beginning of April, I picked up the phone and heard someone shouting at me, hello, hello, then something incomprehensible. Hello, hello, more gibberish. Slowly, as in a dream, the gibberish resolved into language. It's Jerry, the caller was shouting. Oh my God, I thought, it's him. I began slightly to quiver with fear, not because I was talking to or being shouted at, by the actual J.D. Salinger, but because I so feared doing something wrong and incurring my boss's wrath. My mind began to sift through all the Salinger-related instructions that had been imparted to me, but they had more to do with keeping others away from him, less to do with the man himself. There was no risk of my asking him to read my stories or gushing about the catcher in the rye. I still hadn't read it. Who is this? He asked, though it took me a few tries to understand what he was saying. It's Joanna, I told him. Nine or ten times, yelling at the top of my lungs by the final three. I'm the new assistant. Well, nice to meet you, Suzanne, he said, finally in something akin to a normal voice. I'm calling to speak to your boss. I had assumed as much. Why had Pam, this is the receptionist, who was kind of like ran the office with an iron fist, why had Pam put him through to me rather than taking a message? My boss was out for the day, it being Friday, her reading day. I conveyed this to him, or hoped I did. I can call her at home and have her call you back today, or she can give you a call when she gets in on Monday. Monday is fine, he said, his voice ratcheted down another notch. Well, very nice to meet you, Suzanne. I hope we meet in person someday. Me too, I said. Have a great day. This was not a phrase I ever used. Where had it come from? You too! Ah, the shouting. It was back. I put the phone down and took a deep breath, as I'd learned to do in ballet. My entire body, I realized, was shaking. I stood up and stretched. Jerry asked Hugh, stepping out of his office with a mug of coffee. So this person I refer to as Hugh, um, I'll just briefly explain, was this singular figure at this agency in that he sort of was ranked at the level of an agent but did not represent any clients and he was kind of the keeper of the agency's history so you could ask him anything like you could be like F. Scott Fitzgerald published a story in Collier's in 
he would and he'd finish her sentence and be like 1927 the blah 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 and like be able to pull the you know contract for it he knew everything about the agency it was almost scary um <laughs> okay jerry said hugh asked hugh stepping out of his office with a mug of coffee yes i said wow he's deaf hugh said his wife set up this special phone for him with an amplified receiver but he refuses to use it he sighed his trademark sigh to be hugh was to be let down by the world what did he want just to talk to my boss i shrugged i offered to call her at home and have her call him back but he said monday was fine hugh wrinkled his face and thought hmm why don't you call her anyway i think she'd want to know okay i said thumbing through my rolodex she wasn't home and had no answering machine she didn't believe in them just as she didn't believe in computers or voicemail another newfangled invention not yet employed by the agency if you called during business hours you reached pam the receptionist if you called outside business hours the phone just rang and rang as it did at my boss's apartment 20 blocks north of the office I tried again, every hour or so, until the end of the day, to no avail. It would have to be Monday. Okay, so I'm just going to do like a choose-your-own-adventure sort of thing, because there aren't that many people here. Um, I can read one more little tiny section of my Salinger year, um, if you guys would like it, or instead of skipping to this new book, you can raise your hand if you want me to keep up with this. Okay, I'll bow, I'll bow to Kelly, okay? She's in charge. I hope that I can read this from my phone. I've never done this before. I know this is like normal for people to do, but I never have. I do everything on paper, maybe because I worked at an agency that still had typewriters in 1996. Okay, so this book is called The Fifth Passenger. As I said, it is a memoir um, with reported elements. Um, there's actually nothing you need to know. This is the first, these are the first three pages. It's very different than my Salinger year. Um, not in terms of tone and style, but in terms of subject matter, as you will see. We may as well begin with the portraits. For most of my childhood, they hung above the tall teak bookcase in our family room. Rendered in the gauzy pastels popular during the 1960s, these sketches, there were three of them, captured the likenesses of a smiling boy, his age indeterminable, his hair parted neatly to one side, his face slender, fox-like, mischievous. And two girls, whose appearance couldn't have been more dissimilar but for the matching bands of blue ribbon holding back their lush hair. One was dark and striking, her light green eyes in stark contrast to her olive skin and black hair, her features sharp and defined. The other, the one who fascinated me, was a fair, soft-featured blonde, her mouth gently upturned into a smile. She was pretty, the second girl, in the style of a fairy tale princess, her light hair curling around her ears, her expression as shy and modest as the dark-haired girl's was bold and brave. Sometimes, as I lay on the couch daydreaming, I imagined these three children as characters in some fantastical story, Lucy and Susan and Peter from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Snow White, Rose Red, and their bear who turned into a prince. This was the 1970s, the era of free to be you and me and Harriet the spy, and I knew somehow that I should identify with the dark-haired girl, her brazen, direct gaze, that I should make her the heroine of my stories, but in truth I longed to be the blonde with her air of bashful modesty, her pale, gentle eyes. I myself had started out with fair, ashy curls, but they had turned dark like that of the first girl. Each afternoon, I came home from school, sat down at the kitchen table with my mother, ate the snack she placed in front of me, Danish butter, butter cookies from a round blue tin or the rich plum cake she baked in a clear glass dish, and then retired to the family room to read or draw or do my homework lying on the creamy Berber carpet, occasionally glancing up at those portraits. Never, not once, did I try to puzzle out who they were, these large-eyed children, this was, as I said, the 1970s, and then, of course, the 1980s, and low-level artwork featuring children wasn't uncommon in the ranch and split-level houses of my friends. Sometimes those friends came over to my house and we played Monopoly or Life under the unwavering gaze of the pastel-drawn children, 
my mother nearby in a decaying Ames recliner, talking on the phone for unimaginable swaths of time as she twisted the spiral cord around her slender, vain hands. Very, very occasionally, a friend, Natalia or Suda or Jody, would ask, who are they, the kids in the pictures? I don't know, I told my friends with a shrug. No one, I sometimes replied. They're imaginary. The artist made them up. Once or twice, I gave voice to my fantasies. A royal family, I said. A prince and two princesses. His sisters. Suda squinted up at the portraits, her head cocked to one side. I can see that, she said. Like so many late-life children, as we were known at the time when having a child past 40 was regarded as an aberration, I functioned as a companion of sorts to my parents, accompanying them wherever they went, quietly reading in a corner while my mother chatted with friends or playing with Barbies beside the filing cabinets in my father's office, tagging along to this exhibit at the Met or that at MoMA, or accompanying my father, a former actor, to play after play after play, for my mother had long ago grown fatigued with the theater. On breaks from school, we traveled to visit my grandmothers, Rebecca and Pearl, in Palm Beach, or my cousins, with whom my mother had been raised and whom she regarded more as siblings, in Palo Alto, or took carefully plotted trips around the country, winding our way up the coast of Maine or down the shores of Washington and Oregon, or through the Colorado Rockies, staying at hotels with historic significance, Browns, the Broadmoor, and dressing for dinner in restaurants decidedly not designed for children, where the waitresses, nonetheless, inevitably brought me Shirley Temples and Sundays in neat silver dishes, praising my parents for my excellent manners. At home, on weekends, I trailed along to dinner parties in Upper West Side restaurants and rambling Westchester mansions, eating quiche and chicken marbella like a grown-up, then running off to play dress-up in the attic or fall asleep on a pile of fur coats. And those weekday afternoons, as my mother and I sat over cookies or cake, a glass of milk, for me, a cup of lemon tea, pale amber in its thin china cup for her, we talked about everything. Carter versus Reagan, long division, her childhood in the Adirondacks, where she'd snowshoed to school and drank milkshakes at the counter of her family's restaurant. There were subjects, yes which I knew not to bring up, for they made her grow cold and hard and remove herself from me, my hatred of ballet, the bullies who preyed on me at school, anything that didn't accord with her idea that I was perfectly happy, perfectly normal, perfect, that everything was fine. But I trusted that I knew everything about our life. If the subjects of the drawings in the family room held any significance for me, for us, she would, of course, have told me. I trusted, as do all children, I suppose, that the world I knew was the entire world. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> That's It's on. Somebody else had to press a button, I think. Oh. <laughs> Don't take photos of this part. <laughs> While that's going on, I will just say thank you for those who voted with me to hear the new, <laughs> the new book. Um, I'm not sure, especially for um, my students, I know there are some professional writers in the room, uh, but for the folks who, um, who might not realize, it is an incredible privilege to get to hear work that is fresh off the page. Uh, and that is something that you will then, in 
2024, 2025, when, when the book comes out, you will read those first pages and remember today and say, oh my gosh, I, <laughs> I, got, to, I got to hear that first. Um, so thank you for trusting us and for doing that. Of course. I hope it wasn't too much of a downer. <laughs> I feel like my Salinger year is a much lighter book than the new book. <laughs> well, um, I think I, I'm really excited that you read from two memoirs. And I think it is something that I wanted to talk to you about in terms of how do you approach going back into your life, returning to you as a character, once again, um, and as a narrator, and in, in a different book. I understand what you mean about um, that being similar in tone. It's certainly Joanna Rakoff in the sentences. Uh, but how did it feel to come back to yourself on the page? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I started writing this book in 2013. Um, I, I wasn't under contract for it, you know, as I am now, but just kind of as an experiment. Um, I was at um, Sewanee Writers Conference and had more free time than I normally do. and. I had been toying with the idea of writing a book on this subject, and maybe I should just tell everyone. I'll, I'll tell you guys what the book is about. So essentially, um, it is um, the story is I grew up believing I had one sister um, whose name is Amy, who um, is 18 years older than me, and had a very fraught relationship with my parents, um, and was a little bit of a distant aunt-like figure to me. Um, and at a certain point in my childhood, when I was in middle school, I found a picture, um, and I knew there was something weird about this picture. <laughs> it was of a family that I didn't recognize um, at all, and eventually, after thinking about it for a very long time, I showed it to my father, and it turns out, and he started crying, and it turns out that I had two siblings who um, were killed a year before I was born. Um, he didn't tell me that. He simply pointed to the children in the picture and said, that's your brother Mark and your sister Anita. And so I spent most of my life knowing that I had these siblings, not knowing what happened to them, but suspecting that um, my sister was somehow involved in whatever had happened to them. Um, and in this book, um, I go back and report out um, what happened to them, um, which is a process that's taken a, a pretty long time um, for a bunch of different reasons. Um, so to go answer, actually answer your question, um, so this story, this whole mystery, um, I, don't want, I don't know if mystery is the right term, but this kind of absence um, or secret was something that had haunted me really since childhood um, and defined in a strange way, every aspect of my life, the more I thought about it, the older I got, the more I, I realized how this had shaped who I was um, in every possible way. Um, and I also, at the risk of sounding sentimental, y you know, I was a kid who always um, was kind of jealous of big families mm -hmm. and my best friend as a child had it was from a huge, really loud family. I spent all my time at their house. And so this curiosity um, developed in me about you know who were these siblings that I missed. So of course, I would not have been born if they had not died. So that's a you know, so as you can see, this is like a huge conundrum, all of it. and I I thought about it all the time, um, and I kept thinking about writing about it, and I was asked to write about it. You know, it would come up in an interview, and then an editor would ask me to write about it, and I occasionally did, but was never satisfied with the pieces, because there was so much that I didn't know. And so in 2013, I suddenly realized that I had an entry point to the story, and it was these um, drawings that were in um, the living room, and because it, it actually had only just occurred to me that they were my brother and sisters <laughs> as an adult. I hadn't known this. Um, and and I, so I wrote this. And I w had really just finished my Salinger year at that point. Um, and I worked on it slowly, very, very, very slowly, trying to figure out what this book was over the years that followed. 
um, you know, was it simply my a story about my childhood? Because I wasn't sure that that was interesting to me. Um, and, um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I think when I first started writing this, I was the same person that wrote my Salinger year. I, and then I wrote a proposal and sold it, you know, four years later in 2017. And by that point, I was a different person. And so a lot had changed and my perspective on the story had changed. Um, and then I started actually writing the book significantly later um, because I took a break to um, write the screenplay for the My Salinger Year film and then make that film. So I really started writing the book in earnest um, in the fall of 2019. And I really felt like a different person again. And so the book kept shifting and my perspective kept shifting. And it actually made for, um, it was difficult, it's difficult, you know? Um, I keep taking breaks from it and I return to it and I'm a different person. Um, however, I, as a writer, have I, I think a pretty strong aesthetic, um, you know, in terms of the way I put sentences together and also in terms of the way I think about narration. Mm -hmm. um, and I want my books, if even if they're in the first person, I want them to feel like there's an omniscient narrator guiding you through the story. And I want there to be distance between you know, my narration and the story. Um, and I want the reader to sort of, I want there to be um, silences and um, ellipses in, and a lot of white space in the story so that the reader can kind of, is, is never going to be told how to feel. Like my worst fear is, to, is that is sentimentality. That is my worst fear, writing something that is, you know, tawdry <laughs> and of which I'm manipulating um, the reader. So I think ultimately when I, you know, anytime, when I sit down to work on it, I'm still that person with that aesthetic does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I feel like I haven't answered your question. <laughs> I guess maybe my question is also about vulnerability. Oh, yeah. And writing a memoir and then seeing that memoir on screen and seeing a different person play you, <laughs> I imagine, <laughs> right? It's one thing to be reading from my Salinger year here and returning to a scene that you had control over uh, and sharing that. And then once something is released, then there are reviews and people read into, you know, you, you lose control. Um, and then the movie comes out and it's, it's you, but it's not you, but there's a little bit of safety in that distance, right? But you decided to return to the page and do it again. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's simultaneously um, like a little, a bit scary. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's part of it. Um, I, I worry that this is gonna sound like very like negative, but, um, but there's a little bit of fear in, you know, everyone's dream, right? Every writer's dream is of course to write a book that finds a large readership, mm -hmm. right? You know, that is, even if you don't, sort of verbalize it to yourself. That's what you want. No one wants to write a book and have no one read it. Like that's, who would want that? That's just weird. <laughs> and, but there is um, some anxiety with that um, in, in that, um, you know, in my proposal for The Fifth Passenger, um, I essentially had to include a paragraph or two in which I talked about how it would still be the me the me that, I didn't say this, but like the me that readers love, you know, or whatever, <laughs> that, yeah. that it would still be me and that um, there would, the, the book, part of the book takes place now, um, in my life now. And so this is a huge spoiler for those of you who have not read my Salinger year, but there's a character in the book called my college boyfriend. And, you know, I really regret in the book dumping him. And um, after I wrote the book, I got back together with him and we're married now and you know have a child we've been together now at this point for like t for a long time and um and so this is a story that you know people li it's a happy story <laughs> that people like and so essentially you know I had to sort of assure 
potential editors that readers were going to meet me now and see you know how my life turned out because there's definitely it was definitely implied that that was what people wanted and I feel okay with that but I think the scary part is um, just worrying that people are going to come to the book wanting something different than what it is mm -hmm. you know um, that it will feel too sort of dark or sad or something like that. Even though I'm not a very dark and sad person, um, but it is a, a pretty a story with a lot of tragedy in it, um, and it, it's nerve wracking. And so it it has, you know, the real truth is that it's been a very hard book for me to write because of that fear. That uh, I think I wrote my Salinger year. I know I wrote my Salinger year thinking no one would read it. Like I was told by my editor. Point blank, this book has a very limited audience. You know, we really only see this as appealing to people that work in publishing, you know, maybe people in media. It's a very New York book. You know, no one is going to read it outside of New York. And so I was like, okay, you know, and I, I thought of it, I, I embarked on my Salinger year thinking of it as like a kind of palate cleanser. Like, I'm a person who writes big, big novels that are kind of social novels, kind of like Victorian novels. I have another one that's in the works. And you know, I my first novel, I spent six years writing it. And so I thought, OK, I'll write this little short book. And no one's going to read it. Who cares? Like, this will support me and my children. Like, keep food on the table. And then that's not how it turned out. So now I'm writing this book thinking, wait, people are going to read this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, ah. yeah. So. yeah, I mean. I guess that's what I was getting at, is that there is an element of bravery to return to the page, both personally in the in the writing of it, but also in putting it out there. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm I can't wait for the book. <laughs> I'm very excited. Um, and and I wondered, do you have your copy there? Um, can you read your author's note? Yeah. Okay. It's short. glasses. I always forget that. I'm really new to glasses and I'm constantly like, wait a second, why is this all blurry? <laughs> okay. Um, Abigail Thomas describes memoir as the truth as best as she can tell it. And this book is indeed the truth told as best I could. In writing it, I interviewed people I knew during the period chronicled and consulted my own writings from the time and the years shortly thereafter. To maintain narrative flow, I've fiddled with the chronology of a few events, and I've changed the names and identifying traits of most, though not all, of the people. Those minor adjustments aside, this is the actual story of my Salinger year. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know Abigail Thomas, she is an amazing writer who um, I highly recommend everything she writes. <laughs> but she, uh, that idea of the truth as best she can tell it, right? Um, did that mean something different to you? Um, or, or what does that mean to you? Why did you put that in your author's note? You know, I started, so I had never written memoir. I had barely written any personal essays before I wrote this book. And like, full honesty, like I didn't really know what a memoir was. So I was a book critic, but I only reviewed fiction. I had been assigned one memoir in the distant past, like, I don't know, like 10 years before I started writing this book, and it was really bad. And I actually said to the editor, this book is bad. We shouldn't even review it. It's not worth reviewing. And I'd not read any other memoir. And so there was this process for me of figuring out what makes a good memoir. And so I did, in the year after I signed the contract, I read, I'm, I think I read like 100 memoirs. Like all I read, I decided that for that year, I was only going to read memoir. And um, and I will say that like the vast majority of memoir d is not successful. Like it doesn't work. You know, there are all the memoirs where it's like the first chapter was a magazine article and it's really good, and then the rest of the book feels totally superfluous. You know, or you know the book that like was a series on NPR, but it doesn't really translate to the page. Or you know, but then there are the few that are amazing, and um, and I. I kind of analyzed those and tried to figure out what um, made them work. Mm -hmm. I also, this is really answering your question, I swear. Um, <laughs> I also had um, three friends and acquaintances who 
were fiction writers who had written memoirs. Um, and I asked them if I could take them to lunch and just ask them some questions. And now looking back on it, those questions seem so naive. So as in like, I remember I asked them like, how like, you know, how do you like condense everything? Like, is it, I mean, I have, there's just too much. And like, there are certain things where it just like doesn't make sense where it is, but I can't move it. I can't move that thing. And um, one of them, who's a writer, who's really an amazing writer named Saeed Serafiazada, he was like, why not? <laughs> and and I, I was like, I can? He was like, yes, of course you can. Like any, uh, of course, like you can't write a memoir without rearranging things and condensing things and having composite characters. You have to. And I was like, oh. Because I was really a person who was, yeah, I was really a novelist, and I kind of, and a journalist. So I had these, it, it was almost like a kind of really bad combination of things for writing a memoir. Because as a journalist, you're so kind of, um, you adhere to this really strict ethical code. And like, you're not going to write a profile of someone and change how the events occur in her life. Like, that would be crazy. You would, you know, <laughs> lose your job. Um, so... Anyway, that basically is um, is my story. Like, does that? <laughs> so that's sort of how I kind of, yeah. Right, and and you're, I think, what you said earlier in a class was that you are now writing your story, but also other people's stories, and that's a responsibility, um, and also to get it right. But no matter what, I mean, even if in my Salinger year, right, the, your, your boss or the Don character, right, all of these characters in my Salinger year, J.D. Salinger himself, right, um, <laughs> they may have a different recollection or um, a different experience of, of what you wrote um, and probably do some, in some level, uh, but that this is your story. And so this is the best that you can tell it. And I think um, in in my nonfiction classes, uh, I talk about um, the narrator being um, a, a pie. <laughs> and essentially, you, right, the real you, are you're that pie. Um, but then for each piece that you write, you're only writing a slice of that pie because you can't put everything mm. in. You can't condense everything um, and make and put the, give the whole serve the whole pie every time, right? Yeah. Nobody wants that. You can't you can't deliver that. Um, and so the slice is what determines. You know, okay, so these are the characters that make the slice. Um, and the idea that uh, that you can condense that, I think, is real. I find in nonfiction very freeing. And Honor Moore, who was a mentor of mine, I remember the first time she said, "Just start with I imagine." And the idea that nonfiction can be a dream, nonfiction can be conditional, right? Um, I am going to ask you to read one more. You grab your glasses. Um, <laughs> it can also be collective, right? Uh, I know Katie and I were talking about Juliet Suka um, recently and her use of the collective in fiction. And um, I think you do this beautifully in the opening here. Um, would you mind reading just even the first few lines of the book? Yeah. Sorry to make you go back and forth. <laughs> and then um, I promise that you can all ask questions in a few minutes, too. Um, so this is the opening section of the book, and it's called All of Us Girls. Okay. There were hundreds of us, thousands of us, carefully dressing in the gray morning light of Brooklyn, Queens, the Lower East Side, leaving our apartments weighed down by tote bags heavy with manuscripts which we read as we stood in line at the Polish bakery, the Greek deli, the corner diner, waiting to order our coffee, light and sweet, and our Danish to take on the train where we might hope for a seat so that we might read more before we arrived at our offices in Midtown, Soho, Union Square. We were girls, of course, all of us girls, emerging from the 6th train at 51st Street and walking past the Waldorf Astoria, the Seagram Building on Park, all of us clad in variations on a theme. 
the neat skirt and sweater redolent of Sylvia Plath at Smith, each element purchased by parents in some comfortable suburb. For our salaries were so low, we could barely afford our rent, much less lunch in the vicinities of our offices or dinners out, even in the cheap neighborhoods we populated, sharing floor throughs with other girls like us, assistants at other agencies or houses or the occasional literary nonprofit. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, that was Thank only you. two sentences yeah. somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think that also is probably the reason why the editor was wrong. Uh, that this this does speak not just to the specific girls you're speaking about, not just to your narrator, but to a collective um, feeling. Um, and I I just wondered if you could tell us the story of how you knew to begin there in that way. Yeah. Um, so I, as I said had not wanted to write my Salinger year. The idea was presented to me, um, and I was very resistant to it. And my agent, who is kind of a formidable, I always describe her as like Ari Gold on Entourage sort of agent, um, she was very resistant to the idea too. Um, there's a writer named Joyce Maynard who wrote a book about having an affair with Salinger, and she was like, you don't want to be Joyce Maynard. Like, you don't want to be known as the Salinger girl. You know, I haven't actually read that book. I've ne read nothing by Joyce Maynard, so I have no feelings about her. But that was my agent sort of saying this to me. And then um, this editor, whose idea it was, contacted her and got a meeting with her, which is actually very hard to do. And he spent half an hour with her and just convinced her that it was a good idea, um, which is really shocking. And she called me right after the meeting and said, I think you should do it. I think he's right. Um, and I was like, really? And so I just was resistant. I was like, I'm not a memoirist. I don't feel like there's a story there. Who wants this silly story about me at 23 doing these stupid things, like answering Salinger's fan mail? I mean, who cares? And she said, let's give it a week. Give it a week. Try to write the first 20 pages. And if at the end of that week you really don't want to do it, okay. She wasn't like, okay, we'll let it go. She was, because she doesn't let anything go, but she was kind of like, okay, we'll talk about it more, <laughs> and I'll try to convince you again. So I spent that week, I worked at a shared writer space um, on 14th Street and um, on the west side, and I um, used to run on the High Line every day at around five, and um, so I spent that week like in my little cubicle at the shared writer space being like, this is a stupid idea. Like, I'm not going to do this. Like, oh my god. And I had this new novel I was working on, and I had a review due, and I was just like, oh, I can't even. And then, um, and I was trying to think through. I did some research. I was kind of like, what was happening in 1996? Like, could that be, you know, could that make this more interesting to me? And it did make it a little bit more interesting. I was reminded of the stuff that was happening at the time that kind of really changed publishing and media. Like, it was the year that the New York Times launched their website. It was the year that um, Salon launched. And it was a, a, a kind of turning point um, in publishing and media um, that, you know, we, we're still, like, we're in the age that started in 1996, basically. So that was interesting to me, but it wasn't enough to, I wasn't like, I was like, that's nonfiction. Like, that's not, you know, that's like reporting. Like, that's not a memoir. That's not a story. That's a subject. Like, as a journalist, I always think about, like, subject versus story. I was like, that is a subject. That's not a story. So I, on, like, one of the last days of this week, I put on my running clothes, went up to the High Line, was running up the High Line, and um, it's my running symbol. And, <laughs> um, and there were all of these um, young women, like, hordes of young women. It was a very beautiful day. Um, like an unseasonably beautiful day. And um, all wearing kind of like really the same clothing that I had worn when I worked in an office in my 20s, you know, like from like, you guys live here, so you must, you know, from like strawberry, you know, and like <laughs> rainbow, you know, like really like inexpensive, like polyester skirts. And, you know, but then like some of them had like coach handbags and it was clear that like their mom had bought them that handbag. and. They all, so many of them had, you know, tote bags, like these huge tote bags with manuscripts or with stuff in them. And I knew that some of them worked in galleries, because, right, this was like the gallery neighborhood. Um, and I could tell by the way they dressed. My college roommate is a curator. I could tell, like, some of them were gallery girls. And, you know, but they were all young women starting out in whatever kind of, you know, arts or arts-adjacent profession. And 
in that moment, I suddenly saw the larger story. And it's like, this is not just a story about me. This is a story about what it means to be a young woman alone in a large city without a safety net trying to make your way in a profession that even if it's populated by women, as publishing is, is still incredibly difficult and competitive. A, you know, a profession in which you're not going to make a living wage. You know, a profession in which most people who succeed have independent incomes or something that helps them. This is a story, you know, about the vast majority of us trying to make our way in some kind of world about which we feel extreme passion. And so I finished my run, and then I went back and wrote that, those first few pages. And they are unchanged since that day. I love that. I did not know the answer to that question. I'm just <laughs> like, you don't know, but wow, that is beautiful. Um, while you all think about a question that you can ans ask in a moment, I just, I'm, I'll read it so you don't have to read it. But um, there's this great line in here uh, where <laughs> your boss, um, you're interviewing, essentially. and. Uh, you're trying to impress her and uh, talk about Flaubert. And, um, and the answer is, well, Flaubert is all well and good, but to work in publishing, you need to be ri reading writers who are alive. <laughs> and I just wanted to um, ask, who are you reading? And who, um, because I know you're a literary critic as well, um, who should the students, especially when you think about yourself, right, coming out of school, about to go into this world, who should you have been reading? Who would you recommend they read now? Oh, gosh. Well, I can tell you some books that I've recently loved. Um, and then I can tell you some of the books that were important to me at that time. So it just, I read a lot. So um, this is an always sort of changing little list. But some books that I've, my favorite books of the last few months are um, Alice Elliot Dark's Fellowship Point, um, which I think. I think is like truly one of the great novels of like the last hundred years. And I'm, I don't say that lightly. Trust me, some of you heard me talk about how I trashed the kite runner. Like I, <laughs> I, I'm like a pretty, I'm pretty hard on books. Like, and it is, Alice Elliott Dark um, is the author of a short story collection and a, a novel that's much more brief, both of which came out, you know, 20 odd years ago. She's been working on this book for 18 years and it is truly a masterpiece. It's incredible. Um, it's uh, it's also I think politically really important. It's about two elderly women um, in Maine. That I know you're like that sounds boring, but it's not. It's absolutely fascinating, um, and um, it's just so wonderful to read a huge novel um, that in, in which you just sort of become transported to another universe. Um, and it really reminded me so much of you know books that I love, which you guys might not love. I don't know if people read them anymore, like Middlemarch and Daniel Deronda and the Foresight Saga. Um, but it feels very contemporary. It's very much you know engaged with contemporary ideas. Um, another another novel that I read recently that I really loved, which is very different, is The Paper Palace by Miranda Cowley Heller. I absolutely loved it. It if I describe it, it actually sounds like a book I would hate. It's written in the um, present tense, which I actually usually really hate. It's like a huge thing of mine, but it really works. Um, and it goes back and forth between the um, narrator's present day life um, at her family is like dilapidated compound on the Cape and her upbringing. And it has all of these twists and turns and it's really an amazing book. And um, I hate discussing things in these terms, but it is very much about kind of like family trauma and the ways in which we kind of take on our family's trauma. Um, and it's not like about that, you know, it's not like broadcasting that, but it gets at things that have been on my mind and I think are on a lot of people's mind right now. Um, I highly recommend it. I also recently read um, a related memoir that I highly recommend called Upper Bohemia. Um, and the writer's name is Hayden Herrera. Um, and she's really like an art critic and this is like a really like, I mean, I was like reading passages out loud to my kids and my husband because I was like, listen to this, like, because she was raised, you know, in the 40s by parents who were kind of like, who were bohemian, who were wealthy bohemians 
um, you know, from sort of very waspy Boston and New York families. And they were just kind of negligent parents who just like left her alone. And the stories are just crazy in this book. Um, it's not a perfect book, but it's a really interesting book. And I found it interesting because um, it was an interesting way of writing about childhood. Mm. Um, so those are just a few that I recently really loved. Um, and I will say, I also recently read um, a novel by Martha McPhee, who teaches here. And I was talking about it this morning with a friend of mine. And I said it's one of the few books that I would describe as a masterpiece as well. It is so unbelievably brilliant. Um, the writing in it is just like incredible. And the way the story unfolds. And oh my god, it's really one of my favorite books. Like I know it, didn't com it came out a while ago, but it's one of my favorite books that I've read recently. Um, and then I'll tell you maybe a little bit. So this is just a few. I read like several books a week, so it's hard for me to talk about right now. I'll just tell you what I'm reading right now. I um, I recently had to write a piece for a small magazine that was about, OK, so it was an essay about books, about Jews working in publishing mid-century. So there are three books that came out that were all about this um, in the past year. And so they assigned me this piece on it. And I w know a lot about this um, because I used to edit a magazine and we ran pieces related to this. So I read a whole bunch of, I mean, I must have read like 20 books for this piece. Um, and um, and so what one of the books I read is um, Rona Jaffe's The Best of Everything. That's, I, that's why I thought I'd mention it. So it is a beloved book. Have any of you guys read this? Yeah, of course you, yes. So it is about um, women working in, young women working in publishing in the 1950s, basically. And it's really kind of like a pot boiler. Um, she actually was asked, I don't, do you know the story behind this book? Because it's, oh. okay, it's incredible. So this book was a huge bestseller. It continues to be a bestseller. Its 65th anniversary is coming up, actually, and I'm going to write a piece on it. So, but it, um, okay. The way she came to write this book is she, um, like a friend of hers was dating, I think, a movie producer. I may be getting that part of it wrong, but somehow she knew a big producer. And she kept telling him stories about her life working in publishing. And he was like, Rona, you should write that. <laughs> At, like, that would be a great movie. Let's, um, he, I don't know if that was his accent, but that's how I imagined it. It was this like older guy who was like, Rona, listen to me, bubble And so, so he basically um, had her write the novel knowing that it was going to be made into a movie. So she, was, she had a contract for it. She wrote it on deadline. She wrote the whole thing really quickly. Um, and so it's not like, you know, it's not like, I don't know, it's not Dickens, whatever, but it's so good. It's so wonderful. And it really is like a feminist novel, even though I don't think she intended it to be. Um, so I reread it. I've read it a bunch of times for, for this piece. But I then um, am decided to reread another novel of hers that's related to the best of everything called um, Class Reunion. <laughs> and I highly recommend it. It's, re it's amazing. It's, again, it's not like super literary, but it's, it's really, really interesting and also truly feminist and kind of ahead of its time. It's about four friends who graduate from Radcliffe and the paths their lives take. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we just added to our to-be-read pile, right? Um, all right, I think we have a few minutes for some questions. If you can go to the microphone, uh, that would be fantastic. And you know that I could sit here all night asking questions, but I want to give you guys a little opportunity. You just want to run back and buy her book instead? <laughs> oh, I see somebody making a move. Is this on? Oh, okay. Uh, hi, I just had a quick question. Um, what was like your biggest learning point or like learning experience from your Salinger year? And like li working at a literary agency specifically? Yeah. Like I think there were two really big ones and one was that I enjoyed writing um, I know that sounds really basic but 
so part of what happens in the book, you know, is that I, so I'm tasked with sending these form letters to Salinger's fans, and I instead start writing real responses, sometimes like five page responses to some of them. And I loved writing those letters, and it was really the first real writing that I did. I had, you know, I had written stories and poems like since I was a child, and I'd had things published in literary magazines and whatever, but that was the first time that I felt like I was kind of jumping off a cliff in the way that you have to to really write um, a novel or a memoir. And I just loved it so much I could spend hours sitting there typing letters. And um, I also realized, this is the other realization, that the reason I was able to write these letters so easily and so well, like they were, I was like, these letters are the best thing I've ever written. Um, it was because I had, I, I kind of adopted a persona Right, and that persona wasn't Salinger. I wasn't writing in the voice of Salinger. I was writing as me. My name was on the letters, but I had adopted this persona as this, you know, as Joanna Rakoff, mouthpiece of Salinger. And I would think to myself, like, what would Salinger say? I had never even read any of his books. I didn't know anything about him, so like, I had no idea what he would say. Like, what I knew about him was all based on the fan letters. So I mean, it was a little bit ridiculous and like a hall of mirrors. But there is that kind of um, persona allowed me to write with authority. And um, it was a huge lesson about how writing works, what I needed to sort of give myself the authority to say what I actually thought or to sort of tell a story. Um, I think that, it's a little counterintuitive, but that was the biggest lesson I learned. Thank you. Sure. Any others? Um, Are you to? <laughs> I think I am, yes. Um, is there anything specific you'd like to know? Well, um, so he really did not want to receive the letters, but there was a very specific reason for this. Um, so prior to, I believe, 1963, he received all of his fan mail, and he attempted to respond to all of it on, a, uh, on his own. And just to sort of make this clear, you know, he was receiving hundreds of letters a day. Um, he was a celebrity I in a way that is almost inconceivable in this day and age. Like, there aren't really writers who have the kind of celebrity that he does. I mean, I, I can't really think of anyone who is, like he was on the cover of Time Magazine. People would line up at five in the morning when they knew a story of his was going to be in the New Yorker. Like they would get up early and line up at newsstands and then that issue would sell out everywhere because people wanted his story so badly. Like he was truly famous. He, people, he couldn't walk down the street without people accosting him. And so he entered into a correspondence himself with a lot of fans. Um, he felt a great fondness for them, and I think he liked receiving fan mail because he actually wanted to be famous. Like, he actively wanted to be famous. He spent years attempting to write a perfect New Yorker story. That was his goal. He was like, I just want to publish a story in the New Yorker. And he just kept trying and trying and trying until he finally got one. And, like, he studied New Yorker stories to see their formula. So, anyway, in, in and around 1963, um, He's, he had always gotten notes from crazy people, but um, he started receiving notes threatening his children, like threatening to kill his children, and also, you know, people who, they knew people knew where he lived, saying, like, I'm going to come up to Concord, and I'm going to, you know, murder your children, that kind of thing. And he was really genuinely scared. And, um, but he also... So he felt that the letters needed to be monitored, like that if anyone was threatening him, those letters needed to be passed on to the FBI, um, with good reason. And I think he also felt that, I don't think, I know, he felt that the letters were taking, responding to the letters were taking from the same place that his writing came from. So he was spending so much time and mental energy on reading fan letters and trying to respond to them that he couldn't actually write anymore. So he asked Ober to take over. So it was those two things. Um, so it wasn't like a frivolous thing and it wasn't like a sort of jerk thing where he was like, I don't care about my fans. Like he had really valid reasons. 
And I will say, all these years later, you know, the equivalent of getting fan mail now is like people DMing you on Instagram, <laughs> right? You know, or like writing, like, you know, tweeting at you. And, um, and it's not, for me, it's not all the time, but like I go through phases where I'm really, really, really overwhelmed. And I spend so much time thinking about how to reply to people. And I, I finally get it. Like, I, cause it's, it can take over my whole day just responding to things. So I, I do have sympathy for him that I kind of didn't at the time. I was like, who cares, whatever. Why couldn't he just report this to the FBI himself? You know, so um, yeah, so that is the story behind that. Um, my experiences with him, and you can read much more about this in my calendar here, of course, um, were that he was um, a really kind and patient um, and just like very sweet man. Um, he was extremely kind to me. Um, he never behaved inappropriately ever toward me. Like he treated me kind of like a granddaughter. Um, and he also was extremely generous. Um, and he really, um, you know, you described me as generous, um, Kelly. And I feel like I learned a lot from the experience of working with him because he would call. Um, I talked to him on the phone very regularly. Um, and he would call and he intuited through a remark um, of mine that I wrote poetry. I did not tell him that I did. I simply um, just, he asked me about a press, a, a publisher that only publishes poetry. And I said, oh, I read some of their poets. And that oh, apparently only poets read poetry. <laughs> so he determined from this that I wrote poetry. and. Every time he called, you know, he would be like, how is your writing going? And he would give me bits of advice. You know, his big thing was get up and write before your day, before you talk to anyone. I still do that to this day. And, you know, once he called and I was answering, I was um, covering for the receptionist and he heard me answer the main phone and he recognized my voice despite being deaf. And was like, Joanna, why are you answering the phone? You're not a secretary. And he was always saying to me, you're a writer, you're not a secretary. So just having this, like, famous doesn't even describe it, like, one of the most famous writers in the world take you so seriously and be like, how's your writing going? I mean, when I had, like, not published anything, really, you know, was, I can't even, it kind of changed my life, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I found him to be pretty wonderful. I did not find him to be crazy or unhinged in the ways that he sometimes described. And I, I truly, I feel like I have to emphasize, I did not find him to be like lecherous because um, that's often how he's characterized right now. I'm not saying that he didn't do anything wrong. I have no idea. But toward me and the people at the agency, he was incredibly respectful and wonderful. And I think he changed your life in more ways than one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you to Athleen and to the Cultural Center. It um, is always such a fantastic evening when we get to have a writer come for the Great Writers Great Readings series. And um, thank you to the English department as well for uh, letting me do this <laughs> <laughs> over and over again. Um, and thank you, Joanna, so much. Please go and buy the book and give her a warm send off. And uh, join us tomorrow for the movie. Um, you've probably seen the emails. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure. Thank you.